Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Preshaw. I'm be delighted to be speaking to you today as part of this Discovery uh, Week series of lectures. I'm the Dean of Dentistry at Dundee University, and I'm also a professor of periodontology. And the title of my talk is A Healthy Mouth for a Healthy Body. And, and I strongly feel you can't be healthy uh, in general terms if your mouth isn't healthy. And that's something that we're starting to realize more and more as we learn more about the diseases that affect the mouth and how they also affect the rest of the body. You might be wondering, what is periodontology? Um, so it's the study of a disease called periodontitis. It's a very common disease. Um, in, in simple terms, it's gum disease. And it's inflammation that affects the, 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 the gums um, that support the teeth in the mouth. Um, when somebody has gum disease, their gums become inflamed, they become red, swollen, uh, they bleed easily, um, and the gums start to recede. And we have this saying, as someone gets older, they get longer in the tooth. And that, that's a reflection of that understanding that as some people get older, their teeth get longer because their gums are receding. So it's a chronic, non-communicable disease. Um, and we can see on the slide here, we've got a range of conditions from, on the left, healthy gums, uh, where the gums are pink, they're not inflamed, they're not swollen, they're not bleeding, and hopefully that's what uh, most people's gums look like. However, if bacteria build up on the teeth, if people don't brush their teeth effectively, um, then the gums start to become inflamed. And that develops into a condition called gingivitis. And that's what the toothpaste adverts are always telling us about, you know, brush your teeth to control gingivitis and to make the redness go away. If that isn't controlled, then the disease progresses further and it starts to affect the bone that holds the teeth in place. And that develops into the condition called periodontitis, which is a much more advanced condition. And we can see on the, on the image on the right here, uh, this person has got periodontitis. Actually, they never used to have a gap between the two central upper incisors there. That developed later in life just because the bone was receding that held the teeth in place and that enabled the teeth to drift and for that space to open up. The trouble is, it's, it's not usually painful, uh, so people don't realize they have this condition until it's often much too late. And severe periodontitis of the, of the type that we can see here on the right is very common. Um, it affects probably about 10% of most people in most populations. Uh, so it's a very prevalent disease. And it also impacts on our general health as well. So sometimes it's quite difficult to tell if somebody has got periodontitis or not. So you, you might look at this image and think it doesn't look too bad. Um, the teeth look quite clean. The gums are pink. They're not particularly swollen. Uh, there's a bit of recession around one of those upper central incisor teeth. Um, but what we have to do is take the x-ray to see how much the bone has been affected. So when we take an x-ray of those teeth, we can see all of the teeth in the mouth. Uh, we can see the bone levels. And this is where the bone is. That red line shows the bone levels of this patient. And the green line shows where the bone should be. Uh, so you can see how much bone has receded uh, as a result of the disease. So those teeth are not as well held in as they used to be. And they could move, they could drift, they could even be lost. Um, and it's very common that patients, uh, when they've got advanced periodontitis, uh, report loose teeth. Uh, and they may have missing teeth, and that makes it more difficult to eat, and it can make it more difficult to eat healthy foods like fruit and vegetables. So all of these factors around diet and nutrition are also impacted by our teeth and how healthy the gums are as well. Now, my big area of research, and certainly what I'm hoping to develop here in Dundee, is the relationships between periodontitis and other diseases that affect the rest of the body. And so I've put the question there, should we view the mouth in isolation from the rest of the body? And I would say definitely not. Uh, we should not. Uh, but for a long time, I think we have. We've, we've had dentists who look after the mouth, and we've had doctors who look after the rest of the body. And there's not been too much interaction between them, and that's something that I think definitely needs to change in the future. And if you just look at some very sort of simple data, if you imagine a patient with periodontitis, um, as we can see the image of the teeth here on the slide, uh, their gums are inflamed, uh, the gums start to detach from the tooth and they start to recede, and that forms what we call a pocket between the gum and the tooth, which is a space where bacteria can grow, and they're even more difficult then to remove by toothbrushing. Um, but that space is an, in, an inflamed epithelial lining, 
Um, and if you add up the surface area of that gum pocket space affecting all of the teeth all around the mouth, it's estimated to be around 20 square centimeters, which is similar to the, the surface area of the palm of the hand. So imagine that area was inflamed, red, bleeding, covered with bacteria. You wouldn't be surprised if it had an impact elsewhere in the rest of the body because of that. And you know, I've got an image there also on the slide of um, a, a diabetic leg ulcer, which is about 20 square centimeters. And it's no surprise that that person's feeling unwell and there's an impact of that leg ulcer uh, throughout the body. And, and in just the same way, the inflammation in the mouth can affect the rest of the body because there is spillover of inflammation into the circulation from the gums and also bacteria from the gums in the mouth also get into the circulation and spread around the rest of the body and that causes inflammation elsewhere, which is uh, the, the main link, the main reason for the links between gum diseases or periodontitis and diseases elsewhere in the body. Now, now one very important uh, area uh, of, of linkage uh, with general health is with diabetes. So if somebody's got periodontitis, uh, they're more likely to have uh, more severe diabetes complications if they also have diabetes. And if somebody has diabetes, they're more likely to develop periodontitis about two or three times more likely. So we talk about a two-way relationship between the two diseases whereby they each negatively impact the other and make the other one worse. And in fact, if you treat periodontitis in a person with diabetes, uh, you can actually improve their diabetes control uh, with reductions in HbA1c, that's glycated hemoglobin. It's a measure of blood sugar control uh, that are similar to those that you can achieve with some of the diabetes medications. So to me, this really underlies the importance of thinking about the mouth uh, as part of the whole body, particularly in people with diabetes, uh, because you can improve diabetes control uh, by treating a person's gum disease. Uh, but, but many patients with diabetes don't know that, and, and many doctors don't know that. And a lot of the research I've been involved with recently has been trying to educate doctors and dentists to get them to work together to, over, to improve the overall management of their, of their patients who've got these diseases. How, how would treating periodontitis uh, improve diabetes control? Well, well we think it's because uh, when you treat periodontitis, uh, the inflammation reduces in the mouth, and then therefore that reduces the overall spillover effect of inflammation into the rest of the body through the circulation. And recently I published some research that showed that longitudinally over a period of months, if you treat the periodontitis in the mouth, you do see a reduction in systemic inflammation throughout the rest of the body. And so that's a very important finding that will you know, lead the way for future research. So I, I don't want to mon monopolize the, the talk with just talking about my own research. So I'd, I'd like to share some of the other things that we do in the dental school at Dundee. Um, of course, we teach dental students and dental therapy students to become the future dentists and the future dental therapists. Um, we teach them here in the dental school, uh, but we also send them to outreach centers uh, in the surrounding region uh, so that they can treat patients in an environment which is as similar as possible to the general practice situations that they will find themselves in when they graduate. Uh, so we have a number of outreach centers, as you can see here on the slide, in Perth, in Vaness, Aberdeen, Kakodi, our growth in Kupar. And these have been absolutely fundamentally important uh, for our students to receive their training, particularly during the pandemic, uh, because the clinical activity continued in those centers. Uh, so this is across the region, across Scotland. And in fact, the outreach activity makes up around 60% of our student clinical experience. And it's, it's so important for them to be uh, in the environment uh, of the, that's very similar to a dental practice environment that they'll find themselves in after they graduate. And it, it really helps to bridge that gap between the, 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 the specialist kind of treatments that we do in the dental hospital and the more routine primary care procedures that are done uh, in general dental practice. Uh, so we're incredibly grateful for all our partners in these outreach centers uh, for helping us with, with the teaching. Some other areas of research that um, I'd like to just highlight in the last few minutes, um, I've got uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Heather Cassie, uh, who's doing a lot of research um, under the, the umbrella term of choosing wide, wisely in dentistry. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, just uh, as in medicine, uh, a lot of 
treatments that are done in dentistry don't always have a lot of evidence to support them. They, they're just done because they've been done that way for many years. Uh, so, you know, is, is a six monthly checkup uh, the right interval for a checkup? Or, or could some people just go to the dentist every 12 months, for example? You know, these are fundamental questions uh, that need to be asked to, to manage the provision of dental services more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, so Heather uh, um, has recently been awarded a really prestigious fellowship to look at this further, um, to explore the provision um, of, uh, of dental services, um, which services are the most effective, which are less effective, uh, are they a good use of resource uh, or not a good use of resource. And so this is really important to try to understand uh, how best we can provide uh, you know, dental treatment for the, for the population. Another area of, of, of interest uh, to us is, is sort of behavioral management, um, particularly working with children. Uh, so a colleague, uh, Xiang Yuan, has been doing observational studies uh, whereby dental appointments with children are video recorded, um, and then they're observed, and the behaviors of the clinician and the, and the child and the parents are, are coded uh, to try to identify what are the most effective behaviors that the dentist can, can display or can demonstrate to put that child most at ease uh, so that they can get the best out of their, uh, out of their treatment appointment. And so, th so this has been really useful as part of as a project called Child Smile, um, and uh, the project is a collaboration between several universities in Scotland uh, to try to improve uh, the engagement with children with dental services and dental clinicians so that they're not scared uh, they feel it's a normal activity to come to the dentist, and, and we as the dentists, the clinicians, can understand the best way to interact with those children. Of course, this is Discovery Week, uh, and that's why you're attending uh, and watching these lectures. Uh, so our dental students also undertake a number of projects in Discovery Week which are dentistry-related, but not exactly part of the course. And so the, these can be topics that are just an area of interest for the students. Uh, so we've got students who are looking at eco-friendly dentistry and, and the impact of dentistry on the environment, um, dental health services for, for, provisioner, for prisoners, um, the origins of the tooth fairy, scuba diving and oral health, uh, career options for dental uh, professionals, vegetarianism and dental caries, that's tooth decay. Uh, dentistry in films, and robotics in dentistry. So these are some of the really innovative projects that students are doing just to explore and develop their understanding uh, of dentistry um, and, and how it relates to you know, other aspects of, of everyday life. And then finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, a really innovative area that's uh, a, a real center of excellence here in Dundee and, uh, and actually quite unique, which is our forensic dentistry program. So we offer um, a forensic dentistry master's degree and a forensic odontology uh, master's degree. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Sheila Manica and Adamir Franco, run these programs. And, and basically, they're developing techniques uh, to help dentists properly examine uh, and evaluate dental evidence, which then may be relevant in a legal situation or as part of uh, identification of victims, for example. Uh, so, unfortunately, sometimes when, when disasters happen, uh, then, of course, you'll be aware that uh, we use dental uh, examination information to, to help identify people using de dental records. Uh, we also are involved in age identification um, or age estimation uh, by dental means, uh, looking at bite mark analysis if someone has been assaulted um, and other aspects of dentistry and the law. Uh, so some of the interesting areas that uh, Sheila and her colleagues have been involved with recently um, include developing a dental record checklist uh, created for the police uh, so that they're recording the right evidence uh, as part of um, their identification of human remains. And that's supported by the UK Missing Persons Unit, so a really fundamentally important um, aspect of the job. They've also de developed an atlas of dental anomalies. Um, so some, sometimes a tooth may not develop in quite the right way. Um, and that can be very useful then in helping to identify people because it could be a very specific abnormality or anomaly uh, that affects just that person or just that tooth in a particular part of the mouth. 
so that is also a very important thing to record as part of routine dental charting. Um, so uh, yeah, a really, really important area for dentists to understand better. They've also been involved in developing um, a dental damage three-dimensional atlas uh, to help identification um, in trauma situations where there's been dental damage. And they've also developed an anatomical chart for recording the positions of um, piercings uh, and you know, intraoral piercings are very common these days. People have pierced lips, pierced tongues, uh, but we haven't had a standardized way so far of recording um, exactly what they are and where in the mouth. And that also is very important as, as part of forensic dentistry. So I've taken you on a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the work we're doing at Dundee uh, School of Dentistry. Um, I hope you found that interesting, uh, ranging from my own interests on periodontal inflammation and periodontitis and the links with diabetes, all the way through to behavioral studies and our outreach program and uh, some of the forensic dentistry um, um, activities that we're involved with. So thank you very much for uh, watching this presentation and uh, hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you in person somewhere around the dental school very soon. Thank you.